speed. I'm speed. Float like a Cadillac, sting like a beaver. From the Frame Up is brought to you by CSN Collision Centers, Canada's market-leading repair network. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to From the Frame Up, the podcast that weaves through traffic to cover the most important topics in the automotive industry. I am your host, Jared Jones. Thank you so much for joining us. In today's episode, we talk to the co-founder and CEO of Blink Equity about how organizations, regardless of size, can build sustainable solutions to equity, diversity, and inclusion. This is one you don't want to miss. Without further ado, enjoy episode eight, how to build sustainable EDI. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to From the Frame Up. I am your host, Jared Jones. This is episode eight of the season. Joining me today, the guest of honor, Emiliano Boyd, the co-founder and CEO of Blink Equity. Emiliano, what's up? What's up, Jared? Good to see you, brother. How you living? I'm doing all right, man. Appreciate you coming on the pod, the vlog, the the podcast, whatever we call it these days, but appreciate your time. Uh, I really want to get into it early because I think this is just such an important conversation. Before we get into the whole the whole show, all the all the notes that I've made to, to ask you, a CEO in the hot seat, tell the people about Blink Equity. What is it? You know, where did it come from? What's the day to day look like for for the CEO and co-founder? Yeah, well, first off, thank you for having us. You know, it's good to see you again. It's always great to kind of share a time and space with you. So really appreciate you reaching out and, and fitting us into what it is that you folks are doing over here. But really, Blink Equity, we're a, we're a racial, racial equity consulting firm. Um, so the whole approach for us is to really provide systemic solutions to systemic problems, right? We know that anti-Black and systemic racism is a really, really complex problem. Um, some of the ways that we really differentiate ourselves from other players kind of in this space is by providing really this holistic approach on how we go about solving the issue. So you've been kind of privy and part of, of some of the stuff that we've been doing on our side of the fence. This started with real humble beginnings, um, but we started doing the work inside of our, our former employer, Cox Automotive. Big shout out to Cox Automotive. Um, we started to build a black employee resource network there where we felt it was a great opportunity to create and consolidate and really organize black people, create safe space for us to share our kind of lived experience. And then we kind of took it out from there. So we really expanded it and took it into what's started as Accelerate Auto, so a non-for-profit that really looked to tackle and dismantle anti-Black and systemic racism across the automotive space. And that was really the first time that Black people have really been organized and really pointed and focused like that in the Canadian automotive space. So it was great. In the background, we were formulating and really developing our ideas for what we thought made the most sense for a consulting firm. And it was really cool for us to have the opportunity to apply it at scale from a local to a national and an international level and, and certainly across entire industries. So Humble beginnings, but thrilled to be here and, and be doing the work that we're doing with some important work. And we're happy to throw our hat in the ring. That's amazing. That's such a such an eloquent answer. Uh, and obviously, it kind of leads into what I want to talk about next. I think we both, you know, obviously, uh, both of us are, are inspired to kind of work towards solutions when it comes to systemic racism. And that's how we connected initially. I think it was back in, in February or March when Accelerate Auto first launched that we kind of connected on LinkedIn uh, and I ended up joining Accelerate Auto right before you ended up leaving to go on to start Blink Equity. So talk a little bit about what, what your inspiration is. I think everybody's got their own kind of backstories and you touched on it a little bit of, of kind of why you're doing the work. But if you had to put it in kind of a short or long description, you know, what's the inspiration for the work? Why, why is it so important for you and, and why are you doing it today? Yeah, I think that's a, it's a great question. And to your point, right? I think there's a, a bunch of different ways that people find themselves kind of walking along this path. Um, for me, it really started with, uh, with the murder of George Floyd, right? That was, that was the, the real kind of galvanizing and turning point for me. Um, I couldn't pretend anymore that the inequities that my community was facing didn't affect me because it didn't impact me directly. I think I was walking around with kind of these rose colored lenses. And, uh, certainly for me, that was, that was the, the crux of, of me getting involved in applying. I think my passion and my energy into trying to change things fundamentally, not only for me and the people that I love, but also from a community that's like me as well. So certainly that was that was the beginning point. But it, it really it was funny because it, it kind of came from advice from an unlikely source, which is my father. Uh, big shout out to Pops. Uh, but he's not the best, best piece of, you know, best giver of advice wherever I'm at. It's been funny, you know, throughout the years, you know, your relationship with your parents changed. But I think he hit me with some really good information really at the time that I needed to hear. It. And I was just upset. You know, I was emotionally charged up like I think quite a few people are. 
And uh, and I called him and I was distraught and I was certainly angry more than anything else. And I was telling my dad, like, we got to do something. I don't know what to do. And he was like, well, if you really want to affect change, it's not going to be, you know, going out and, and being violent. That's not going to help anybody. He was like, if you really want to drive change, he was like, find a way to do it in a way that's meaningful, in a way that actually changes the conversation. Look at your area of influence. Can you drive impact in your place of work? Can you drive impact in your area of influence? Can you affect legislation? Can you put together groups or organizations or community work that will have lasting and sustaining effects? And that was really, I think, the right thing that I needed here at the right time. And that really helped me channel some of my passion, some of my energy and some of my focus into delivering work in a, in a real way that I thought gave us an opportunity at real change. And, and it's clear through some of the initiatives that we've been involved in already and in the work that we continue to do now through Blink that this is absolutely the way, at least for me, to play my part in trying to create more opportunity, more equity for, for myself and for my community. That's really well said. And I think you nailed it at the end. The whole the whole last answer was amazing. But for for me, it resonates a lot at the end. It's we talked a little bit before about kind of carving out our own space and making change in our own kind of corner of the world. There's certainly space for for you know the flashbulb moment that was the you know the murder of George Floyd. That that galvanized, like you said, everybody across the planet, right? There was people in the streets and, and there's certainly space for that. And that's necessary because that helps bring attention. But for us, you know. In a corporate space, it, it might not be might not be my bag to go out in the street and, and to protest and to march and to walk and do those kinds of things. So is there a way that I can affect change, you know, in my organization, in my community that still felt that still has an impact? And I think that's where you nail it, is that it doesn't always have to look the same. It doesn't always have to be the same model. Right. So there's a different approach that you can take to it. And it, it's certainly making an impact uh, definitely within the automotive industry, which is how we kind of got connected, like we said before. So. Let's let's use that as kind of the segue. This is obviously a difficult topic for a lot of organizations to talk about, mm -hmm. right? So, what is your typical client like? How do you how do you initially broach the subject of hey, this is something you might need to address, and what is that client's response to that? Yeah, well, I think that's a that's a great great question because everybody knows it's it's undeniable, right? Everybody sees what's happening in social media. Everybody's seeing what's happening in the media cycle globally, right? We know that there is more focus and attention currently on the plight of Black people as a global community than probably ever before, just because of the way that we're connected so now more so than ever we were in the past. Um, but as great as it is for people to know that there's a problem and to know that there needs to be real change from it, when you're talking to professional settings and organizations or even educational institutions, institutions or association, the only real opportunity that you have to galvanize people into movement or action for the most part is, is the same way that they make every other of their business decisions. It has to make sense financially for the organization to pick up this work, and there has to be a tangible return. The reality of the situation is if people cared enough just to do this kind of good work out of the kindness of their hearts, for the most part, you know, we would have been either considerably more further along the path to solutions than we are now, or it would have been so altogether. So we know it's not going to be just because it's the right thing to do that people jump on and do this kind of work. So the conversation that we try to bring to the table and the way that we help organizations and educational institutions figure out why it makes sense for Blink to be an active part of your organization is there's huge profitability in diversity, right? There is absolutely, uh, and it's proven in, in research across the board, there is real tangible financial impacts to making the culture of your organization and the inclusion that it has for its employees, a more prominent part of your business strategy. So we help organizations understand first and foremost, way before we ever get to the conversation of, hey, this is the right thing to do it. Let's be good citizens of the world. Um, we talk to these people like they talk to themselves. Every other conversation or opportunity that they have where they sign over some dollars for a service, it always is because there's a return and a profitability for the organization. So we help organizations understand the competitive advantages that come with diversity and inclusion, the profitability that comes from diversity, really the competitive advantages that it drives from a recruitment, a talent retention standpoint, all of these things. So we talk to them like they talk to themselves. And for the most part, that's how the doors open up. We help them understand how our product helps make more money for their organization. It just so happens that the side effect of it is our product actually helps people in the process as well. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. And I think, you, you know, I'm sold on it. And I know that there's so you can check out uh, BlinkEquity.com. He's got he's got a pretty tight uh, rubric there that they use that you guys use once you actually get into the organization 
uh, step-by-step process that you guys followed. It's obviously had some success to this point. I think it's very well thought out. It makes total sense. And the approach in general obviously makes sense, right? It's one thing to just say, hey, we're, we're going to be noble citizens of the world, as you put it. Let's just do this out of the goodness of our heart. That, that hasn't happened, right? Which is why we're in the situation that we're in today. Uh, and, and I do think that there's a there's obviously an advantage to speaking the same language, right? There's a return on this investment. You know, there's there's a value proposition to what we're trying to do. And also, you know, you're being a good citizen. So that that makes total sense. What is so this is that was kind of like the pitch. That's kind of like how it's it's happening once it's implemented. What does the lead generation look like for for your right? Like I feel like that's that's got to be the hardest kind of door to open because you're basically saying to a potential client like there might be an issue with systemic racism in your organization, or you might want to look at diversity and inclusion, you know, in your organization because there could be a problem. Now, maybe some organizations are being very proactive and they just want to yeah. they want to talk to Blink and just make sure that they're checking the boxes and that everything's running smoothly. But I think for a lot of organizations, they're in the red when it comes to EDI. So what does that look like? How do you start that conversation? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And, and it's interesting because, you know, it's it's funny how the narrative comes about when you're talking about social justice work, because people expect there to be, you know, we're, we're out here holding hands and kissing babies. We generate business the same way every other organization does. We hammer the phones, we pitch people, we email people, we reach out where we think there's opportunity. But also, like I said before, right, like there the way that really the only real opportunity that we create for the business is, is by helping organizations and educational institutions understand the financial impact of this kind of work. And, and traditionally, in a lot of organizations right now, DEI work really sits with HR and that's about it, right? And, and it's really hard for you to address a systemic level issue if it lives in a siloed place. Likewise, a lot of the solutions that organizations are looking at are single point solutions. Let's bring in an unconscious and conscious bias educator. Let's look to recruit or hire more black people. If you take black people and put them in a machine that is intrinsically broken, you're not really doing anything. You're checking off a box. Certainly it feels good to put some kind of action into place to try to move the needle. But if you're not looking at this at a structural or systemic level, if it only lives in your HR department, if it's not tied to executive bonuses, if it's not part of the pro- the career progression opportunities that are part of your organization, you're really just kind of putting band-aids on bullet holes. And if we're the first person to come in or the first people to come in and let you know that, hey, there's probably some lack of equity in your organization when it comes to your racialized people, pick up the phone and call me because you need a lot more help than you probably think, right? We know that it's not the case. You know, we you look at, at the leadership ranks, you know, the Black North Initiative, I think, is a great example of, of their being proactive effort and focus on creating opportunities for Black people in positions where they get to make decisions. So we know it's not in happening in one specific place. It's happening all over the place. What really we've come to find is that organizations really need help wrapping their arms around, you know, the size and scale and complexity of an issue like this and they need a real roadmap that they can follow in order for a fundamental new normal to be set because like I said before if you're bringing in these single point solutions you're going to help one part of the issue but you're ultimately just going to be moving the bottleneck a little further on and what we do is we come in and we really try to create structural equity so we try to create this new normal for organization by going in and working through all of their current operating processes Everybody's got a hiring practice. Everybody's got an interview process, a recruitment model, uh, you know, procurement strategies that they use. Everybody has this, every organization, every educational institution, every association, they all have these processes that support their organizations currently. So coming in and gutting all of that for there to be something brand new and never thought of built before, for us, it's just not realistic. But what we can do is we can go in and we can work with the already existing, existing excuse me, operational processes of the organization and we can insert some specificity for black consideration across every single part of that process. And what that ends up creating is a new is a new operating structural norm for the business or for these organizations that doesn't have to be dependent on black people in order to keep the effort and the work going. We help organizations ultimately mine more equity from their existing existing operating processes, and that creates more space for dedicated marginalized groups. What's really cool about it, and what we found out kind of, we, we kinda, I guess we stumbled on this as we were doing the work, was that we deliver the work from a Black-focused lens because that's our lived experience. 
but certainly the work that is creating and generating more equity from current operating processes, that helps every in any marginalized community. You can take black out of the mix. And if we show you how to mine more equity for your marginalized folks, you can apply the same approach to LGBTQ, to women, to Asian, to indigenous, to first, you know, it literally any and every marginalized community that's a part of your organization. And we didn't know that that's what we were playing with when we were putting the pieces together. But very quickly, we found out there's in a scalability in the work that we do. There's innate sustainability in the work that we do. And very quickly, we found out that there was replicability in the work that we do. And for us, we think that's the only approach to really solving or, or putting a big dent in this thing. That's amazing. That's amazing. Innate sustainability, innate scalability, innate replicability. Um, uh, I think we just found the trailer for, for the episode. <laughs> that's that's amazing. I just I, I love the way that you present that. Right. Because it's such an important thing, because I, I, I kind of want to talk about what the approach is, because I know you've got mm -hmm. something. I'm not going to I'm not going to call out the term and let you get into it. But you've got an actual approach, right? A systemic approach yeah. to a systemic problem that you pitch to your clients. And in, in order to, to do that, there's some challenges and hurdles that you've got to overcome in terms of their own biases, or their own thought process. So I want to kind of jump ahead a little bit. What like what are some of the challenges that you face as the co-founder and CEO of the organization when you go in and you have that conversation? I know one of them is, well, what about this marginalized group? Yeah. Right? What about this group? And you've kind of answered that where this is scalable. We're talking about it from a black lens because this is our lived experience. But take this out, apply it to this marginalized group and you facilitate that same sustainability and growth. So I know that I know that that's kind of the model. But what's the pushback to any of that conversation that, that you hear most and then maybe get into without without sharing the secret sauce? How do you defeat that? Like, how do you, how do you get past yeah. those challenges? Yeah, I think that's that's a great point. Right. So I think the very obvious, you know, and first objection is, is, hey, you know, why black? We have a ton of groups that really need help. Why are we focusing on black? And the reality of the situation is just like you said, right, that's our lived experience. And really what's critical in there is lived experience is the only way that you can get that real feeling, the real impact of, of the way that these systemic inequities really impacts you as an individual and us as a larger community. And that should be the starting point for how you start as an organization organization to build a bridge towards more equitable outcomes, right? It's not, it's unnatural for somebody who is not living these injustices or these inequities to be the person that is in the best position to solve them. So certainly for us, like you were saying before, that lived experience is a critical component, not only for the work that we deliver for Black, but if you asked us if we can help with LGBTQ or Indigenous or First Nation or dis, you know neurodisabled or whatever it is, you need people that live that because they're the only ones that can tell you how it feels, how they get impacted. And that should be your foundational piece for how you then start to provide solutions. So the first objection is always, why is it black focus? And we say, hey, that's the way that we can help you best understand and best solve these issues. But very quickly, like you said before, there's replicability that allows you to apply the exact same approach for any marginalized community and for it also to hold true. Um, beyond that, I think the, the largest obje objection, it's interesting because it's not one that is pronounced overtly, I think it's just the willingness, right? The willingness to take on and commit to the kind of transformational work as an organization that would be required in order for this to actually be successful. So it's one thing to bring us in and say, hey, yeah, Blink, can you come in and take a, help us take a look at how we're addressing, you know, issues of anti-Black and systemic racism? And can you help us solve the issue? That's one thing. The ask is one thing, but certainly the commitment that it takes for the action for that to become how the business operates, therefore, like moving forward, that's a really different thing. And it takes absolute buy-in from a leadership team. It takes real commitment from a financial perspective as well, because the reality of the situation is anytime you make real operational adjustments for an organization, it's not going to be free. There's going to be costs associated to it. So certainly I would say some of the stuff that we've noticed is there's great willingness for people to bring us in and to sit down and to really start to strategize and take a deeper dive into some of these issues that affect their black employees, where often progress stagnates or slows down is right. very quickly when they start to understand what kind of commitment it takes from them as well as an organization in order for this work to really come to fruition and for really the real change to happen. So it's interesting because people don't lead with that. You know, people aren't like, hey, you know, we want you to come. But, you know, we're not sure we want to do everything that you're saying. And certainly there, there's quite a bit of, I think, a balancing act on both sides of the fence. But really what we see is like, 
if you're serious and committed about driving this change, it, it takes real effort and it takes real commitment, not only from a, a verbal standpoint, but also from a visible and actionable standpoint from your leadership team. People need to know that you are committed to doing this work. That's a huge part of how the work gets done and how the culture gets shifted. And then you know the deal. You know that none of this work comes for free. So financially, there needs to be a commitment that follows suit in order to be able to support the kind of transformational initiatives and work that needs to be done for these organizations. So I think one is more blatant, one is more straightforward when they tell you, hey, why is it black only? And then I think very quickly, like you were saying, where does it start to really slow down and where do we have to really kind of get people bought in and, and really help them kind of move through that level, that original discomfort is when it comes to commitment and seeing through these actions to completion. I want to talk about, I'm going to let you say the actual term that you guys have come up with. I want to talk about the approach. What's the approach that you guys take? Take It's the blink. What is the it? The blink what? six. The blink six. Okay. So get into that a little bit. Take me through some of that, if you would, what that looks like, you know, what, why those specific solutions and, and why they work. Yeah, absolutely. So so Blink Six is a six step, six month process, and that's our, our real signature program. Um, and the real idea there is, is to your point, right? It, if you're doing any of this work in less than a six month window, hard to really believe that that real transformational outcomes will come from it. So that's the minimum time that we need organizations to commit to partnering with us in order for us to really come in and really affect this lasting change. Um, but we really start with a full assessment of the organization. So the step one part of it is, is really full assessments. So we come through and we take a look at organizations really from the top down, levels of representation as a leadership team, uh, levels of representation for black people within succession plans, everything from your hiring practices, to your recruitment practices, to your procurement policies, to your supplier chains. How are you currently sourcing? You know, what's the voice of the company? What, what are the company values? Because another thing is this work cannot look and feel like it comes from somebody outside of the organization. Right. Certainly we're here to help guide and, and to provide advice, but for employees and, and the real impact to happen at an organizational level, they have to know that this comes from efforts that come directly from the, the organization for the organization. So we really look to implement ourselves as much and really entrench ourselves as much into organizations as we can so that we can make sure that we're talking to employees the same way that they do, that the messaging that we're putting out there is directly in line with how they present themselves as organizations as well. So right. full well, you know, assessment at a stage one piece, that also includes a critical component, which is a wellness check for your black employees, right? Let's touch base with them. Let's find out the lived experience and their shared common experiences being black employees of your organization because all of these DEI initiatives are all great but if they're not directly tied to the specific needs of the of the the employees the black employees within your organization you might be missing the mark or doing some work that you don't need to be doing or, or wasting energy or efforts in other places so we always want to get a, a real pulse check on black employees and the lived experience that happens uniquely within your organization and so for that first month part we really like I said before do a full assessment of the organization organization where we really get familiar with how they present themselves with the lived experiences there. And then we very quickly turn in and pivot into our second step, which is data collection. So we know that nothing measured is nothing that you can prove progress against. So we really have a large scale data component that is actual surveying of demographic specific information, right? What does it look like from a representation level across the organization as a whole so that we can start to establish these baselines for us to be able to measure against in the kind of action plan that we put together for these organizations. So before we do the data piece, it is also critically important that we lay the foundational psychological safety for black people and black employees and marginalized employees to submit this information openly and willingly. So we saw a huge reticence from black representation in submitting this kind of information to organizations because often in instances in the past, this information has been used against them or they feel targeted or they feel like they them voicing concerns about their unique experience as a member of a racialized community sets them apart or blackballs them or whatever it is. So there's a huge element of foundational and psychological safety that we have to provide. And in the assessment in particular through the wellness check, we really set these kind of foundational pieces together for there to be willingness, for them to start to submit this voluntary information for the organization to be able to tangibly track the things and set criteria and KPIs for the work that they want to get done. 
Now, very quickly following that, now that we've done a good assessment, we understand how the organization shows itself. We take a look at educational curriculums as well and development curriculums. Now we move into from a data collection to an educational standpoint. Everybody throughout the organization has a different level of comfort in education around anti-Black and systemic racism. And we come in and build custom curriculums for people at the leadership level, at the management level, as well as individual contributors. And we really encourage organizations to have an onboarding component that speaks to the importance of these values for the organization to know when you're a new employee onboarding into our organization, this is who we are and this is that what we're about. So we right. do a full-scale educational curriculum and training program for these organizations that is ongoing. We started in the third month, but it is an ongoing process. Um, a really successful one that we've seen have a ton of success and impact for organizations is uh, a signature program that we roll out called Seeing Race. And what it is, it is a video recorded, you know, interview session, kind of like this, less cool though, less, less good looking people on your end <laughs> when, when we're doing this. It depends which organization you yeah. go to, you know, you go, you know, uh -huh. you're right, you're right, you're right. <laughs> You know, they got good looking cats all over the place, but certainly what we do is uh, is we get senior leadership from the organization to have uncomfortable conversations about race with their black employees in the workplace. Okay. And really what that does is it really showcases the willingness of leadership to be directly involved in the work. And that goes a huge way of, of building trust for employees across the organization. And it's a great way of kind of education through storytelling in a format that is perfectly safe for not only the person, you know, the, the member of the leadership team, but also for the black employee. And it really sets foundational pieces like I was saying, for leadership to be actively involved and very visible in the fact that they are committed to this work instead of it being just kind of a stroke check on the side. So there's a huge educational curriculum that we roll out there. By month four, we really start to do the adjustments of these operating processes like we were talking before. That's yeah. your hiring process, your interview process, your recruitment process, mentorship, sponsorship programs, procurement policies. Procurement is one that's not talked about enough, I don't think. The real equity, you know, and certainly in the work that we're doing for organizations, we are building equity for employees directly within that organization. But the biggest E in equity is at a community level. And the way that we do that is we help organizations diversify their supply chain by bringing a full network through our program called the Black Connection of Black entrepreneurs and businesses to the door of these organizations. So they can start to build these lasting and long-term financial partnerships with minority and Black entrepreneurs or businesses that allows them not only to generate equity within the organization, but to take that play for equity outside of the organization into the communities that these organizations operate and service. So really a, a big, it's, it's a really important piece for us to make sure that we touch on not only the equity that we drive within organizations, but also bridging an equity gap at a community level. And by diversifying procurement policies or supply chain, we have a real opportunity of doing that. From the Frame Up is brought to you by CSN Collision Centers, Canada's market leading repair network with more than 200 collision and auto body repair facilities located across Across Canada, CSN has you covered. CSN's expert technicians and customer service specialists repair more than 200,000 vehicles every year, helping Canadians get back on the road with the trust and confidence that their vehicle has been repaired safely and properly. Visit csncollision.com for more details. CSN Collision Centers, we'll straighten it out. So past that adjustment pace, that's really what builds structural equity. It really, like we were saying before, that's the way that you take the onus and the obligation away from solely black people to help make a real solution and a lasting solution. So really by building it within the and making those adjustments with those operating processes, we really build this new structural equity for organizations. Now past that, we've done a lot of work, right? I'm doing a lot of talking, but we've done a lot of work. Uh, yes. But at, at month five, at step five, we really like, like to start championing the work. So really activating and turning on the voice of social justice for the organization. This is an important one because this is also a great way for financial impact to be brought back to the business. This is a huge part of where organizations get to see the financial value of doing this work. And certainly when we did it for an organization in the past, over about six months of creating Black-focused industry initiatives and creating Black-focused initiatives within the organization and community organizations and all of these things, we we're able to generate upwards of a million dollars in publicity and PR value for an organization. That drives huge, huge financial impact. It's a great way to get your brand out there. It really creates this kind of competitive differentiator in terms 
terms of recruitment tools for particularly black and marginalized talent. And it's a great way to show the impact from a financial standpoint of the work that we do. So we do some championing internally by activating kind of the voice of social justice. But we also like to structure and build together, you know, black employee resource groups, something that allows to gather like minded individuals, really a central place for that passion work to be delivered for black employees. And then externally as well, we did great work with Accelerate Auto and really turning on the lights to an industry wide push of bringing organizations together in a large capacity in order to tackle such a huge and complex problem. So really, we're looking for also thought leaders and visionary leaders of organizations in order to start similar industry wide initiatives. How far can we push the boundaries of our effort and our fight and our commitment to really changing the narrative around anti black and systemic racism, not within it, not only within our organization or our communities, but can we drive impact at an industry wide level? And that's something that we have experience doing that, like I said before, we're kind of looking for like minded individuals to help us push that narrative as well. Now, by the end of this, organizations have gotten well tired of, of hearing me kind of ch chew their ears off for a while. Yeah. Um, so we turn around and, and by the six month, we really start to develop a long scale sustainability plan. Right. So so the work is not good enough if it's only effective while we're involved and in the mix. There needs to be a way for this work to continue. And like I was saying before, really for this new norm to be set by organizations. So in the latter month, in the six month and the sixth step of the process, we start to build full scale sustainability plans for the work to be ongoing for organizations on a long-term basis. And we also offer to continue our consulting services at a reduced cost if organizations are just looking for a bit more of a guiding hand to kind of help them along their equity journey. So by long and by large, six months, six steps, critical components of how we feel like it makes the most sense to drive real impact, but we call it the blink six. And what's really cool about it is it works. So, yeah, so it's sure. nice for us to be able to bring it to the table for organizations. Yeah. That's amazing, man. That's that's amazing. I'm I. There's so much to unpack there. The the easy way to do it is for anybody watching this, BlinkEquity.com. Um, that's where you can see the Blink Six. Uh, it, it it's such an interesting aspect of what you guys are presenting is that it isn't just hey this band aid solution, pay us a, con a consultation fee. We'll come in and do a you know a two day course or something like that mm -hmm. with certain members of the organization, then we'll leave. That, I mean, that's that's never that's never going to have any real sustainability to it. Taking a a much more structured approach to it, a phased approach, taking data collection and and accounting for for some of the the gaps that there might be in terms of the organization understanding what the problems are, and then the two parts that that I absolutely love that that I kind of participated in a previous employer was the employee resource group and kind of the mm -hmm. education seeing race piece, where it's like, hey, here's a group of like-minded individuals, regardless of, of race or ethnic background, that want to kind of tackle this issue. And then here's what we're going to do to present some of that information to internal stakeholders. Here's how we get educated about the subject, because different people's understand people's understanding of the issue is going to be at different levels across the organization. It's great if you convince the president or the senior HR person that there's a problem. Support staff, middle management, if they don't see it as, as being an issue that they need to have some stake in, then it, it, there's not going to be a real lasting change there. So I, I love the approach that you guys are taking. Um, I want to ask a question about, about impact because we talk about all this stuff making impact. You talk about how this is successful. We were both athletes. You know, I, I kind of had a go to route that I, I ran you know, and didn't have too much success with the other ones. But but pushing deep 10 and out and, and I'm always there. You might be, you know, jumper from the left elbow or turn around from uh -huh. the baseline. I know you play ball. So there's there's something that you go to changing sports fastball. Like what's the yeah. pitch that you throw? Like you need an out. Like what's the one that you throw to a client that just kind of like hammers at home where it's like they had their back up. They had their back up. And OK, like I get it. This is this makes sense. Is there one that you go to? Is there one that you rely on? As like a pitch? As like a straight out? Like, what's my one line closer? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't want you to spill it here necessarily because you got to save that. But like, <laughs> is there, is there, is there a, a data set? Is there is there something that you go to that you can pull? Oh, yeah. Yeah, is, yeah, this yeah. This is really impactful. I know you may not know this, but check this out. You know, chew on this for a second and then think about whether or not you know, this, this is something you want to push to the side. I, I really think this is something you can consider, that kind of approach. Yeah. So, I mean, from a really, and, and I think you're, you're right on the money there, right? If, if this is just my opinion, what does it matter, right? right? If this is the opinion of the person I'm sitting across, what does it matter? Really, the, the critical, I think, turning point for any of these conversations is helping people understand systemic racism, in particular, anti-Black racism. This is not subjective. This is objective. And it's something that is 
proven statistically. I think numbers that, that really blew our socks off, certainly while we're doing it on the accelerated auto side of the piece, uh, side of the fence, excuse me, there are 3,300 plus franchise dealers in Canada across the border. Not a single one is black owned. That's a real problem. That is statistically showing that there is something that creates considerably more opportunities one way and removes them from the other. Another number that really hurt my heart, um, on the U.S. side of the fence, a black woman would have to work 561 days in a calendar year in order to make, on average, what a white man does. That's a crazy number. That is an absolute crazy number. And to me, it doesn't make sense that we're running around pretending like this is, it's funny, I guess I got to be careful because yeah. it's often okay. when like we, or, we can we can edit the hard hitting stuff out. We want to keep it we want to keep it at a digestible level, but but we want it to be real, right? So so yeah. go, man. Don't, don't feel like you got to Yeah, well it's funny because organizations, you know, quite often when, when they talk to us, they say, "Hey, you know, it sounds great, it looks great, it makes a lot of sense, but unfortunately financially, you know, that's not where we're at." It's almost as if organizations are doing us a favor by allowing them to come in and make more space at the table for black people. This is not work of favoritism. This is not work of the heart. This is not charity work either. The reality of the situation is what I bring to the table, what we put together as an organization through Blink, it helps organizations make more money. And if that's ever a conversation you are dismissing because it has a, a tangible, real impact to the way it affects people's lives within your organization, that's not a me problem. That's a you problem. Sure. With the reality of the situation is people will start to understand. And certainly some of the leaders that we're working with right now, you can tell they pick it up. The market shifts and trends way before everybody does it. And it's always the first movers that get the most impact in return from making the move. And certainly what we found very, very quickly is these leaders, these organizational leaders that are looking for that new competitive advantage that differentiate them, even though they have a similar product set. I think automotive is a great, great, great example. Everybody's car gets you one from point A to point B. It then becomes a question of the detail and the preferences, but certainly social and conscious capitalism is something that is a real thing. Young people more and more today are making political decisions with their financial choices and certainly adding an arm to your organization that is predicated, visible and vocal about the fact that the, when you work with us, we are an organization that supports doing the right thing for our communities. That drives a real impact from a differentiator standpoint. If we can show you how to increase profitability and productivity for current assets that you're paying for, that's another way to drive impact financially for organizations. So I don't even it's less of an effort of, of trying to convince people that this is the right thing to do, because that's not really my market, to be honest. There are right. people that have never cared about doing this kind of work and will continue to not care about doing this kind of work until somebody either shames them into it or they have nowhere else to run and everybody else but them is doing it. The people right. that I'm looking for and the people that we're looking for as an organization are the people that see the opportunities before everybody else does. And what's really cool is we've been really fortunate to talk to a bunch of people that are like that in mind and in approach. And that's considerably more where we're spending our time and our efforts in trying to build lasting and meaningful relationships and partnerships with with clients. That's amazing. Uh, you handled that question very, very well. I threw I, I tried to throw you a bit of a change up, uh, but I, I love I love the solution. I love the approach where it's it, it it's conscious of current social climate. Right? Like, let's be honest, like th there, there's an opportunity here and the timing is such that this is this is the right time to try to implement some of these changes. And they're long overdue. Yeah. But you rewind two, three, four years. Maybe there's not enough traction or enough social buy in to addressing this kind of systemic issue as there is today. So I, I, I totally agree that there, it's it's the right time to do it. Um, and obviously you guys have a very regimented strategy uh, and it's it's obviously successful. This has been an amazing chat. I got one, I got one last question, then we're gonna get into so, some of the fun stuff at the end. What would you give an organization regardless of size? What piece of advice would you give them other than giving you a call? Um, about creating, you know, sustainable solutions to equity, diversity, inclusion within their organization. Because we have to look at it, I, I think of it from kind of two lenses. Like I work at corporate, but our, our licensees are similar to franchise locations. There's 215 of them at CSN Collision Centers across the country. Some of them have staff that numbers 10 to 12 people, right? Our organization has around 40. Uh, the organizations that you and I previously worked at, you know, previous employers are in the hundreds, so regardless sure. of size, what's one thing that you would say is, is a piece of advice that they can follow, take home from the conversation we had today to help, you know, kind of create a foundation for, for sustainable EDI? I'll tell you a story instead. How about that? Let's do it. Uh, 
So my best friend's girlfriend, um, so I'm 6'4", 225 pounds. My best friend's 6'7", like 250. We're big boys. Um, And she was asking us, hey, fellas, when you're walking down the street at night on the sidewalk and a girl is walking towards you, do you cross the street? And we're both like, no. You know, like we slide over, we let her walk by and we keep going about our business. And she was like, well, take a second to notice, because I bet you more often than not, if you're walking towards a girl, if the two of you are walking towards a girl and she's by herself at night, I bet you more often than not, she crosses the street. And it's because she's afraid of you. She doesn't know that you're great people, but certainly large men are real physical threats to women now and have always been. And I had to be like, wait a minute. I didn't even think of that. That thought has never, never crossed my mind. I have never looked at another person walking down the street towards me and been like, man, let me cross the street in order to keep myself safe, because that's not how I perceive the world. That is not my lived experience. But as soon as she said it, it gave me an opportunity to be like, "Okay, so if I just want to be more considerate or more empathetic to the things that, that women face, I don't have to be the one that forces or or leaves the decision to her to create more safety for herself. If I want to be proactive and if I want to be an ally to girls around the world, maybe I can get up off my side of the sidewalk and excuse myself to give her the clear path for her to feel psychologically safe. That lived experience, again, is absolutely critical in shaping any kind of solutions for anybody in any circumstance. So if I had to tell any organization where you start, listen to your people, listen and create the opportunity for there to be willingness for them to share what it really is like to live as a marginalized community within your organization. Because if you do not, it is highly unlikely that whatever your best efforts or best intentions, whatever your best initiatives are going to be, it is highly unlikely that they satisfy the unique needs of that marginalized group. And the same way I had no idea that women are walking down the street terrified of me because I, I feel like I'm a good guy, you know, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't attack dude. somebody, <laughs> you know, in broad day or at night for any, you know, for no particular reason. But I don't know what she's thinking on the other side because I've never walked in those shoes. And if I can create an opportunity to hear it back from her, then I can say, hey, if I really care and if I'm serious about wanting to help, there are things that I can do today that make that difference, that start to make that change. So I would say 100% if there's one thing, if there's at least a fun, fundament, fundamental or foundational piece to start with. Just listen to your people. They'll tell you what your problems are if you've done a good enough job of creating a safe space for them to share it with you. Amazing. That's that's that's, that's such a valuable piece of information that I think is so often overlooked. It's that there's already people within the organization that can give you good feedback. And if you're committed to this, then listen to them first and then address any potential problems or, or issues from there. Uh, wise words uh, from the co-founder and CEO of Blink Equity. I can't let you go. I can't let you go without playing Fast Five. Okay. That's fine. Okay. So on this podcast, oh, everybody does something different. But on this one, you know, I'm the manager of the Dwayne The Rock Johnson fan club. And yes. I was the first movie that he was in in the whole franchise. They've done nine. I watched the ninth one. Yeah. Watch it, but you don't need to watch it twice. Uh, Fair <laughs> enough. Okay. So it's a, it's a great movie. I just love the I love the concept of them going from like California kids stealing DVDs to then working with like British SAS agents. It's nine movie franchises. Crazy. But Fast Five is my favorite one. So in this podcast, we do five automotive related questions because you're on an automotive podcast. You want to play? Yeah. Five yeah. Questions. You ready? Yeah. Mark, get set. Go. The car that you learned to drive in, the nickname of the car you learned to drive in. No nickname. First car I drove was my ex-girlfriend's Volvo. It was an old white one and it was dope. Uh, favorite food to eat in the car? In the car, favorite food to eat, Sour Patch Kids. Uh, favorite car from a TV show or movie? The one I drive, 428i BMW. Uh, favorite song to listen to on a road trip? Whoa! Spotty Audi Dopalicious from Outcast. Okay. And the nickname of the car you're driving right now? Black Beam. Time. That was pretty good. That was pretty good. I threw, I threw you for a loop uh, on the first one, but great answers. Uh, this has been an amazing conversation, man. I, I hope that we get to do another version of this. Uh, we're obviously going to stay connected. Uh, you can check out Emiliano, BlinkEquity.com, Instagram, 
Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, go reach out to him. Uh, systemic solutions to systemic problems, Blink Equity. Uh, appreciate you coming on. I think it's understated the importance that people like you play in this space. Every opportunity to have this conversation is a good opportunity to change or impact somebody in a way that they might not have ever been impacted before. So I hope people let you know every time you do this, in particular, you know, I can speak for myself in the work that we do. Every time you give other people and black people an opportunity to speak from an elevated platform, you potentially open the door to somebody else that would have never ever cared about this stuff. So I certainly, I. I can't understate, I can't overstate enough the importance of the work that you do in, in creating these kinds of forums and spaces for people to come in and share their honest perspective and impact on the work that they're doing. And I hope you know you're helping more people than you know, man. So, so I really appreci appreciate the kind words. Hopefully we can do this conversation again. Obviously, you know, we'll, we'll stay connected. We're gonna continue to have these conversations back channel. Hit up Emiliano, the co-founder and CEO of Blink Equity, blinkequity.com. You can check out From the Frame Up, fromtheframeup.ca. You can like and subscribe on YouTube. We're also on SoundCloud at From the Frame Up. That's it. That's all. Keep it real.